We think that the Gulf Coast oysters are the best tasting and the best selling oysters in this country. The Gulf Coast oyster, not only representative of the very best seafood that the Gulf Coast has to offer, but an integral part of the Gulf Coast culture itself. What better enjoyment is it to have your family and maybe in the wintertime sitting around a campfire eating a bag of oysters, drinking a beer, a Coke, or sweet tea. That little shell that these things come in holds some of the best nutrients that you'd ever want. The oysters being the backbone of what we do uh, is really built on the fact that oysters are a very, very sustainable resource in the Gulf. Oysters produce their own environment. They produce the reef itself, which they and other organisms depend upon. And at the heart of this oyster industry, the dedicated people who keep it going day after day. It's brutal, it's, uh, it's demanding, um, very physical. You gotta love it to, to be in it. And strong back too. <laughs> it's about a sense of duty, it's about family, and it's about loving what you do. We love being on the water and you know we love growing our product and you know putting our product out there for the country to enjoy and uh, you know the world actually. If you love it enough, it's in your heart to do it, you'll do it. I mean it's something that we love to do. I mean who doesn't want to do something that they love for a living? If you look at the Gulf Coast region from the shores of Texas all the way around to the panhandle of Florida, you'll find oysters' impact on the economy is significant. In fact, the Gulf Coast oyster industry produces about 500 million pounds of in-shell oysters per year, providing a staggering $700 million in total economic impact. We have fishing communities uh, that depend upon the oyster resource. We have families that have been in the oyster industry um, for generations. As a shellfish biologist, I feel that it's a particular privilege to live in a culture where people think that the seasons are shrimp, crab, crawfish, and oyster. Not only are there uh, whole towns that built their history uh, on oysters like Apalachicola, uh, or cities like New Orleans where you know a lot of our travelers come here specifically to eat oysters and enjoy the food and culture of our region. It's very important to keep that going. These people right here, they come from other states. They're not from Florida. They, they're here from Tennessee, uh, Indiana, Georgia, and they come down here to stay here because of the weather, but they come here to eat these oysters too. Of course we do the steam, then we do the fried and uh, the po' boys and uh, the oyster platters. So. Uh, uh, we have, we've had a lot of success with them, and uh, it's very it's vital to our, our business. Last year we were, we were shipping 300,000 oysters a day, and it's, you sit back and you say, 300,000 oysters crossed the dock today. Wow, that's a lot of oysters to be eaten, but you realize the hands that oyster passes to get to the consumer. So everywhere along the way, someone you know, is employed and someone's reaping the benefits of what we do you know, when we get it out the water. Much of the oyster business, like so many of the other seafood businesses, is family run, passed down from generation to generation. P&J Oyster Company uh, started back in 1876. It's the oldest continually operating oyster company in the United States. When Grandpa came into Mobile in the uh, late 1800s, uh, went down to uh, Oyster Bay area right below here, married into the old uh, Plash family. We've been four generations in the business since, uh, we, we say, around 1896. Been here all my life. My father was raised back here, born here in 1924. My great, great uncle started this. His name was Dewey Miller. 13 Mile was on my mama's side of the family in the early 1900s. My dad bought it when he came out of the military for my mother's family in December of 1957. Been in the business all my life, born and raised, uh, third generation uh, fisherman. I uh, have my son who's in the business, which will probably make the fourth generation. My grandfather came from, uh, back then it was Yugoslavia, back in 1904 actually. He got a job working for one of the uh, oyster farmers back then. 
and uh, he fell in love with the work. We grew up on the water. We spent our summers on the bayou, just living a, a life that most people would only dream of. It's really the American dream. Uh, father coming over from Europe, my mother working as a waitress, and both of them, you know, coming together and starting out on a boat and then learning, you know, from scratch basics on their own how to do this. We deal with almost all families, you know. I think it must be in your blood. You know, you get that little bit of salt water in your veins and it's hard to get it out. The Gulf Coast oyster community has spent millions of dollars in out-of-pocket expenses to build up oyster reefs. When the oyster develops to a late larval stage, it needs to find a hard bottom on which to settle. And if it doesn't find a hard bottom, uh, it will die. Year after year, um, oysters are reproduced through building oyster reefs and bringing the shells back from the processing facilities to go out onto the oyster reefs. We try to put out good dry shells on our oyster beds to catch a wild spat set. And we hope that natural spat will attach to our shells. I mean, we always do that in the summers. An oyster takes up to three years to grow. If we don't transplant and, you know, provide colch and rock and shell for the bottom, for this, for this oysters to spawn and to set on, then within the next couple of years, you, you, we won't have anything. The industry has a private lease area and it has the public grounds. The public grounds are often referred to as the seed grounds. And so the seed grounds tend to be in saltier water where there's better reproduction, but higher mortality of oysters. And the growing grounds tend to be in the lower salinity water where reproduction is not as high, but mortality is less. They have a 800,000 acres set aside for production for public use. In certain times of the year, we're allowed to go over there and harvest seed oysters and plant them to our own leases in, a, in, in the private sector. We strategically try to place them in areas where we can get the most growth, the quickest growth, and the, the quality of the growth, the quality of the meat and oyster. So what we'll do is we'll let the seed oysters grow to market size, and once they reach market size, we, we begin our harvest. 98% of what I harvest is, or what our family harvests is off our private leases. We have, you know, leases, oyster leases all throughout the state and we have them in all different zones and we have them for that reason so we can keep a production somewhere in a zone. And as a farmer, you don't want to just produce, you want to overproduce. You want to produce more than what you need to sell to survive. The sustainability criteria is that we've developed is that you can fish as many oysters as nature gives you in a particular year but you cannot deplete the reef itself. This is a year-round process. It, it, it's non-stop. You have, you have to be on top of it, so to say, 24-7. Once they are harvested, these Gulf oysters are ready for processing. The product comes in on a refrigerated vehicle, is unloaded onto our platform, and then typically is put through an oyster washer where we wash the, uh, the mud and grit and have an opportunity to sort the oysters from the sack that was landed on the boat. In the Gulf states, we have the most restrictive regulations of all those around the coast. We have to refrigerate our oysters much sooner than those people on the east or the western uh, seaboards, which in my belief makes our oysters much better and higher quality than anyone else's. The last 25 years, really, we've, we've dealt with the issue of naturally occurring bacteria in the water that are at higher levels in, in warmer months. Uh, these are generally referred to as Vibrio bacteria. To take every possible measure that we can to make sure everyone is as well protected as possible, we are refrigerating the product as quickly as, as possible when it's landed. There's different colored tags that we use uh, on our oysters that we sell. The white tag oysters that are refrigerated very quickly aboard the boats, those can be shipped for direct sale. The green tagged oysters have a longer time span in which 
they can be harvested in up to eight hours before they have to get in refrigeration. We put a rubber band around each of those and they're taken to a post-harvest processing facility that eliminates any of the Vibrio bacteria of concern. There are several methods for the elimination of Vibrio in oysters post-harvest. First is the IQF, or individual quick freeze process. We take the top shell of the oyster off and they're placed on a conveyor belt through a freezer and they're frozen at minus 85 degrees Fahrenheit for nine and a half minutes. Frozen IQF is, is a big item in the industry. Uh, most of it goes to casino chains. It's very easy to use and its uh, shelf life on it is incredible. Next is the high pressure process. The high pressure process technology um, they'll come in, we take them inside of our HPP machine, and that pressure pushing against the oyster really, it, it reduces the vibrio to a non-detectable level. The oysters will pop open, and the shuckers are easily able to slide the oysters into gallon tins, and we'll take them and get them weighed and packed and shipped out to, to various customers, whether it be a, another processor or a retail customer. And finally, the most current process, irradiation. And they're lowered into this pool of water and at that point the irradiation process happens. It takes about 20 minutes. The oysters are still alive, which is a great quality of irradiation. After years of growth, careful cultivation, harvesting and processing, finally comes the end result. Enjoying America's best selling and best tasting oysters. The Gulf Coast is the nation's number one supplier of oysters, providing well over 60% of all oysters commercially harvested in the United States. There's, uh, to me, no comparison. Gulf Coast oyster is the best oyster in the world. But when you eat an oyster, you can, you know, it's like tasting the Gulf. It's, it's really, it's, uh, it's a delicious item. They are uh, salty. They are good. They're clean. Uh, a lot of generations have grown up on these oysters from all over the world. The reason that I believe that the Gulf has such great oysters is that we have so many different growing areas. The estuaries in Louisiana alone are more than anywhere in the country. And when you combine all of the Gulf states, we have far more estuaries, brackish waters, bays and bayous and lakes and streams that oysters are produced that have different flavors unique to the places that they grow in. Every different area has got a different flavor. You notice perhaps different flavors and different textures from different regions. Uh, and even throughout the year, you know, the, the flavor and texture changes a little bit in, in Louisiana oysters. I think it's important for people uh, to be able to look at all these different oysters and realize that there's an abundance of flavors and options that come out of the Gulf, just like there are up and down the eastern and western seaboards. They're fantastic and delicious, and um, it's as good as any oyster you're going to eat anywhere, and I'll stand by that statement anywhere I go. Oysters are a rich and natural food source, low in fat and high in protein. They're high in zinc, important for both healthy male reproductive systems and immunological functions. They're also high in iron and contain a significant amount of selenium relative to other food sources. Oysters are also a good source of omega-3 fatty acids. About a dozen oysters a week will provide you with all the omega-3s that you need. Those are the, um, the, the fatty acids that keep your cholesterol levels in balance and, and help people to be heart healthy. Oysters are not just oysters, all right? They are an important part of the natural world where freshwater meets uh, salt water. You know, the reefs that oysters are grown on our nursery grounds to all of the other fisheries. The shrimp, the fin fish, uh, the crabs, they all go on to oyster reefs because little critters live in those reefs. And so as they feed, they, they uh, clear out the water and decrease the cloudiness or turbidity of the water. And this allows uh, more light to penetrate into the water column and uh, this is beneficial to submerged aquatic vegetation as well. They process water through their, through their bodies, they spit out fresh water, and um, they're an essential part of clean, healthy estuaries. With um, reefs that have a lot of height or topography, 
they are important in breaking uh, the waves and decreasing the wave energy on shorelines. And so there are engineering structures that are being developed, engineered oyster reefs that are being developed to help protect eroding shorelines. There's a great effort going on right now all around the Gulf to rebuild reefs, to reseed reefs. Um, there's even a cool um, shell saving program, I believe, started here in New Orleans. Well, the oyster recycling program is something we tried to get going for since we started. Now we're able to fill up uh, garbage cans with just oyster shells. They pick them up five days a week, uh, process them, and then send them right back out into the Gulf. To help support and protect the interests of Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida's oyster communities, the Gulf Oyster Industry Council, or GOIC, was formed. I made it to the first meeting the GOIC ever had. It was in Biloxi, Mississippi. What year that was, I do not know. The Gulf Oyster Industry Council uh, was formed back in uh, 1994 because the Food and Drug Administration wanted to ban the sale of our oysters. Anytime they want to shut us down, we'd be there fighting. And if it wouldn't have been for that, we would have been shut down a long time ago. Their big job is to go to Washington and fight some of the battles that the members of the oyster industry are having. They have been very effective in creating a coalition of elected officials in Washington, D.C. that's been able to support positions that we've taken on regulations, support positions that we've taken on water quality and preservation of our ability to farm oysters. We don't have to go fight Washington or different meetings. We can stay in the field and do what we have to do. They have our back to ensure that we can continue to do that. With an eye toward the future, the GOIC along with the Gulf shellfish community are working together to increase Gulf Coast oyster production and ensure sustainability by the use of oyster hatcheries, which will not only increase natural oyster production, but also increase the region's resilience to natural as well as man-made disasters. We want to make sure that we'll be able to continue to uh, succeed and survive uh, into the another generation. Gulf Coast oysters and those who toil to bring them to us are now and will remain a vital part of the Gulf Coast seafood industry. They just don't know any other way to be. I see a good future. There's a lot of oyster eaters in this country, and it gives a lot of us a lot of pride to be able to serve the oysters that have always been available. This cuisine was built on Gulf seafood, and, and, and oysters play a, a critical role in that. I mean, we have a resource here that's just, there's no place in the world that, that could, uh, but we have to manage it. We need to support in any way, shape, or form possible the oystering community. In the end, we're still all working together to make sure that every, every, all the regulations and the production is right for all of us. We've lost our crop several times, but uh, you don't stop. You know, if you keep going, you keep, uh, you keep moving along. It's what we do. Uh, as long as I can see one live oyster out there, I know I have hope to bring, you know, to, to stay in business. I believe it's just some long-term cyclicality that certainly gets perturbed by natural disasters and man-made disasters. Hurricanes, they come at us, we come back. Oil spills happen, we come back. We're still here. Not too many jobs left that provide you with the amount of aggravation and reward that this industry does. <laughs> As one of my friends said, the world is round. Sometimes you're on top, sometimes you're on the bottom. And hey, we spin, you know, but one thing when you're on the bottom, you know you're spinning back to the top some kind of way. I love what I do. I love it down here. I mean, what's not to love about where I'm at? I mean, it's all I want to do. I don't want to have to do nothing else. I had people asking, when's I going to retire? And when a good Lord calls me home. What we do is a passion to us all. You know, we're many generations in the business, people in the oyster business in the Gulf. And it means a lot to us. So we're working really hard to make sure that the generations in the future can carry on a tradition that we have. Because it's a fine tradition, it's a great tradition, and what we do is good for the environment and good for everyone.
Mike Voisin, founding member of the Gulf Oyster Industry Council and longtime champion of the Gulf of Mexico seafood industry. Mike's gentle spirit, calming influence, and clear vision continue to inspire and encourage us all.